Hello and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I am Amy Hajari Case. I am a senior medical advisor for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, and I am so happy to welcome you to our webinar today. It is our second annual ILD day. Um, uh, we are celebrating this in the middle of September, which is Pulmonary Fibrosis Awareness Month. And uh, so a real focus on awareness and education. And our webinar today is hopefully going to um, highlight both of those. Um, we'll be talking today about progressive pulmonary fibrosis and what patients need to know. And I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming Dr. Anna Podolanchik. She's uh, at Wild Cornell uh, Medicine. She is, uh, give me just a minute. We have had a little bit of technical difficulty. I am apologizing in advance. Um, everything is gonna run smoothly from here though. Um, Dr. Podolanchik is an internationally recognized uh, expert in interstitial lung disease. She trained at um, NYU School of Medicine and did her residency and fellowship, excuse me, at Columbia. Um, she is. Uh, she got additional training uh, in advanced pulmonary diseases there, and also earned a master's of science in patient-oriented research from the School of Public Health there. She is an funded investigator. She studies novel risk factors for pulmonary fibrosis and focuses really on understanding early or subclinical interstitial lung disease. And she's a site investigator for many um, uh, multi-centered clinical trials for new therapies for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm so happy to welcome her. Um, before I turn uh, the stage over to Anna today, I will um, tell you that just Take a take a good look at her picture there because she is joining us by phone due to the technical difficulties that I um, referenced before. And um, but she will be presenting um, all of uh, um, all of uh, by voice, and you should be able to hear her without any difficulty. Um, I am going to let's see. I'm going to turn my camera off. And Anna, thank you so much for being here. Um, I am on slide three. And as I'll let you get started. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me to, sp to speak about this important topic. Um, so I'm going to um, just move right along. Um, these are my disclosures. I have grant funding from NIH and ILA, and I've re received some consulting fees regarding um, uh, interstitial lung disease from Beringer and Varia Regeneron and Roche. Um, and so next slide. Um, so this is slide four. Um, this, so in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, first I'm going to talk um, at length about what is this new term called progressive pulmonary fibrosis and how it affects patients. I'm also going to talk about how we diagnose progressive pulmonary fibrosis and how we treat pulmonary fibrosis. Next slide. So ILD is uh, comprised of an alphabet soup of different terms. And so when doctors talk about this entity called interstitial lung disease or ILD, we often mention uh, a bunch of different terms, things like IPS, UIP, COP, LAM, CHP, CTD ILD. Um, and it can get all very, very confusing for patients and for doctors as well. And uh, now we've added this new term. I don't know if um, Amy, if we can advance um, to pop up the term PPF or progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And so I want to just take the next uh, 40 minutes or so, 30 to 40 minutes, to break down uh, these terms and specifically this new term called PPF or pro progressive pulmonary fibrosis and what it means and hopefully demystify it a little bit. Um, so in order to do that, uh, next slide, um, should be on slide six, um, we need to take a step back and really talk about what is interstitial lung disease and what is pulmonary fibrosis and how this new term progressive pulmonary fibrosis fits into that. So next slide, um, interstitial lung disease or ILD refers to a group of more than 200 different lung diseases. And so as a pulmonologist, I see patients with all kinds of lung diseases. That includes things like airways diseases, so that's COPD and asthma. Some of us take care of patients with cystic fibrosis, with genetic um, 
types of lung diseases. And then a subgroup of all, um, all the lung diseases um, is what's called interstitial lung disease, or ILD. And then within that, as a subgroup, we also have patients who have different kinds of pulmonary fibrosis. So these are all umbrella tar terms and subcategories. And I'll spend more time explaining what those things mean. So next slide should be slide eight. Uh, so interstitial lung disease, or ILD, results from inflammation and or scarring of the tissue that surrounds the air sacs of the lung. And so you have on the left here a schematic of what a, uh, a lung looks like. And you can see that uh, in the lungs, you have um, branch airways that branch progressively into, into smaller and smaller and smaller branches until you get out to the edges of the lungs. Um, and along those airways also run blood vessels. Um, and so on the right here, um, you can see that at the very end of that branching, you have what's called bronchioles or small airways, and then they end in the alveoli or the air sacs of the lungs. And in those air sacs is where gas exchange happens. So next slide. Uh, and so um, in those air sacs, in a normal healthy lung, you have oxygen that comes in and carbon dioxide that comes out. And the primary function of the alveoli and of the lung as a whole is to, do, to participate in gas exchange. So it's to bring oxygen into, your, into the body and to remove carbon dioxide from the body. And so you have, in very close proximity, you have those um, terminal um, bronchioles, and then you have those alveoli, those spinal air sacs, and surrounding them are those blood vessels that um, bring, take up oxygen and, take, um, and bring in carbon dioxide. And so that's what happens in a normal healthy lung. But when you have interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis specifically, um, a patient can get scarring and or inflammation of the air sacs that make it difficult to get oxygen into the body. And so you can see on the left side, um, the air sacs, um, the tissue surrounding those air sacs is thickened. That yellow membrane um, is, uh, uh, is scar tissue and it's thickened. And so it makes it a lot harder for oxygen to diffuse or enter from those alveoli into the bloodstream. Um, and so that's what happens in um, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, next slide, slide 10. Um, so there can be many different causes of inflammation and scarring in the lungs. And that uh, leads to different types of ILD. So that's part of the reason why we have so many different names for the types of interstitial lung disease, because there are so many different causes uh, of interstitial lung disease. And so one of the causes is medication. Um, there are many different medications that can potentially lead to interstitial lung disease. I've listed a few of them, uh, most commonly amiodarone, certain types of chemotherapy, and an antibiotic called nitrofurantoin can occasionally, not in everybody, but occasionally can cause injury um, and eventually potentially scarring in the lungs. Um, certain types of radiation, so radiation to the chest um, for treatment of cancer can also sometimes lead to pulmonary fibrosis. Um, certain environmental exposures, uh, and I, again, I've listed just a few, but there are many potential environmental exposures, but specifically exposure to mold, uh, exposure to um, certain animals, and specifically birds, um, and or bird products, so feather and down products, exposure to farming can all sometimes cause interstitial lung disease. There are a number of different autoimmune diseases that can also sometimes uh, result um, in interstitial lung disease. I've listed some of the most common ones here. So scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome. There are many others, things like myositis, occasionally lupus, although rarely, um, can cause um, part of that autoimmune disease can be lung disease and specifically interstitial lung disease. There are also a number of different jobs and occupations that can cause ILD, so asbestos exposure, uh, coal exposure, silica exposure, sodium tuberculosis, or just a few that can cause interstitial lung disease. And then, um, in many cases, we cannot identify one specific cause of the interstitial lung disease. Um, and we call those um, interstitial lung diseases idiopathic. It just means that we can't point to the one thing that we think caused cause it. We can't identify an autoimmune disease or a medication or 
any other thing. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a cause, there totally was a cause. There might have been any number of different exposures in a um, genetically predisposed um, individual that resulted in that disease in their lung. And so in that category of interstitial lung diseases without known causes um, is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPS. And so that's just one type of interstitial lung disease. There's also things like idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, or what we call idiopathic NSIP. There are many others that are considered idiopathic. Um, and then there's, and sometimes we just can't classify it into one of these categories. We can't quite say that this is this one particular type of ILD, and that, or there might be over, overlapping um, causes or um, exposures. And so that's when we say that the interstitial lung disease is unclassifiable. Uh, next slide, so slide 11. Uh, many of those ILDs that I just talked about can result in progressive replacement of healthy lung tissue by scar tissue, and that's what we call pulmonary fibrosis. So on the left side, you can see that a healthy, what, what a healthy lung looks like on a CT scan. Um, and on a healthy lung, air, in a, on a CAT scan, um, air shows up as being black. And so you can see that in a healthy lung, most of the lung fields um, are black, and then there are those airways, um, normal, but most of the um, air sacs here on a CAT scan when in a healthy lung show, show up as being black. Versus on the right side, this is a lung with uh, very advanced pulmonary fibrosis. There's very little black. Um, that there's very little space, very little remaining healthy lung tissue, and very little space available to participate in that uh, normal gas exchange that, that happens, and very little ability for oxygen to um, easily enter into the body. The rest of the lung is distorted, uh, and there's um, just progressive scarring in the lungs, and those healthy alveoli have been replaced by scar tissue. Uh, so this is what very, very advanced lung, lung, uh, lung with pulmonary fibrosis looks on the cast. This process doesn't happen overnight. The so next slide, slide 12, um, you can see that um, in many patients, interstitial lung disease and eventually pulmonary fibrosis develops over many years and sometimes even decades. Here's one example of a patient that in 2014 had very subtle and slight abnormalities uh, on a CAT scan. Um, you can perhaps make out that the lung, it's the lung fields themselves are not entirely black, that there's this haziness to them. This is what we call ground glass opacity. To us, it means that there's some early injury, some injury or uh, inflammation in the lungs, but it's very subtle, and you can make out that there's still lung, healthy lung tissue underneath, and uh, the lung has not been distorted by scar tissue. Whereas four years later, in 2018, those uh, what we call ground glass opacities, that those early signs of injury in the lungs have now progressed. There's much more white haziness, um, that the white on the CAT scan um, signifies that there's been um, some more persistent scarring um, in the lungs. And so you can see here in 2018 that the lung is much more distorted. Um, and then four years later, those changes have organized even more. And now you can see very clear scarring in the lungs. And it's a, a lot more similar to the scan I showed you on the earlier slide, where there is now just irreversible scarring in the lungs. But again, that whole process took eight years. Um, and so this, this is oftentimes a slowly progressive process, not in everybody. Um, and the challenge, and let's just go to the next slide, um, slide 13. The challenge with this being a very slowly developing process is that oftentimes symptoms of interstitial lung disease don't develop um, until a substantial portion of the lung has been affected. And this makes it very challenging to diagnose these diseases early. It takes a lot of damage to the lungs before patients develop symptoms. And even when patients develop symptoms, those symptoms are often nonspecific. There include things like a cough, often a dry cough that might come and go and might be attributed to other things, post-nasal drip or asthma or something else. Um, and it takes a long time before a patient is uh, properly diagnosed. Um, one of the earliest signs is shortness of breath with exertion. And oftentimes patients just say, oh, I'm just getting old and these symptoms get dismissed by patients or by doctors. And it's, um, it's not until 
the shortness of breath is much more persistent and sometimes even present at rest that somebody gets properly diagnosed. Other nonspecific symptoms can include things like fatigue or just general fire, tiredness and occasionally weight, weight loss. Um, but again, these are very nonspecific and it makes it challenging for, to, die, to find patients um, early when uh, treatment uh, or any kind of intervention may make, make the biggest difference. So next slide, slide 14. So it's important to make a timely and correct diagnosis of a specific type of interstitial lung disease in order to initiate appropriate treatment. So when we see a patient with interstitial lung disease, we take a very long history. We ask about all those different kinds of exposures to try to see if we can find a cause for the interstitial lung disease. We do, a, um, we do an exam, we take a lot of blood, um, and then we, are, we do a CAT scan, um, and sometimes patients need uh, a bronchoscopy with a biopsy, or sometimes they end up getting a surgical lung biopsy. So to make the diagnosis, we need all those parts, and we, need to, we come together and try to bring all of them together to make a specific diagnosis of one of those types of interstitial lung disease. Because the treatment of the interstitial lung disease will often vary and will depend on the, what we think the cause of the interstitial lung disease is or what the type of the interstitial lung disease is. So in some patients, the initial treatment might include immunosuppressive medications, but in others, it might go straight to antifibrotic medications. And in others, the in first line of treatment might just be removal of the causative exposure, and then we see if the, the lung disease gets better or stabilizes, and they may not need additional treatment. And then we also look for associated conditions, so we treat the underlying autoimmune disease if that's present. But we also look for things like pulmonary hypertension um, or any other associated conditions that might need treatment that might actually be the things that are causing the most symptoms. So next slide. Uh, so some types of interstitial lung diseases progress even with treatment. And that's when we start talking about this entity called progressive um, pulmonary fibrosis. So on the left side here, this is just a schematic diagram of um, different, of, of the disease behavior that we sometimes see in interstitial lung disease. And so there's different um, natural courses of the disease. So in some patients in that top line, um, so, on, so let me just back up one second. So on the bottom, you have time on the x-axis, um, and that time is in years. So it could be five years or 10 years, but it's usually a, a pretty long time. And on the left side, on the y-axis, you have what's called disease progression. So that just refers to this kind of the stage of the disease, how, how advanced the disease is. Um, as, as we go down that y-axis, the disease becomes more progressive and more advanced. So now patients can have different disease courses. Some patients at diagnosis um, may be very stable for many years with or without medication. Um, other patients in that second line from the top may have slow progression of disease. So it may just very slowly um, increase in extent over many, many years. And there are some patients that have very rapid progression from the type of diagnosis um, over, over several years. Their lungs progressively develop more and more and more scarring. Um, and it's very hard for us, it's really impossible for us to predict at diagnosis which patient is gonna fall on which line. Um, and then on top of that, patients can have what we call acute exacerbations which are flare of the underlying disease, which can often lead to an accelerated progression. So patients could be very stable for many years, and then they all of a sudden get flare, and we can't even figure out what caused the flare, but then all of a sudden their lung function uh, drops, and then they never rec uh, um, recover from that. And then um, they might fall into one of those other lines and have more rapid progression at that point. So it's a very challenging disease for, for us to, um, to, to predict what's going to happen. The, the prognosis is challenging, and it, it's hard for patients to know what's going to happen in a month or six months or two years or five years. Um, and so within that construct, within that concept of um, having different disease uh, trajectories, um, 
you can, uh, again, going back to the categories of the different types of interstitial lung disease, uh, you can see that uh, within the different types of interstitial lung disease, you have those fibro uh, pulmonary fibrosis or fibrotic interstitial lung diseases, and then some of them are progressive. And then, Amy, I don't know if you can advance just um, to uh, click. So under progressive fibrotic interstitial lung diseases, you have IPS, which is um, always progressive. That's one of the things that defines idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF is that it at some point is going to be a progressive disease. It may not be at the beginning, it may be stable for many years, but just looking at all the patients over the years that we've taken care of with IPF, this is um, by definition, a progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease. However, all those, all those other interstitial lung diseases that I mentioned, things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis or HP or exposure-related interstitial lung diseases or autoimmune-related interstitial lung diseases or uh, all the other interstitial lung disease, they may or may not be progressive. And so a subtype of them, a certain proportion of patients with those interstitial lung disease will develop progressive fibrosis, but others will not. And so those, um, in, um, in contrast to IPF or interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, we try to um, categorize patients with those types of interstitial lung diseases and monitor them and identify those who are going to develop the progressive disease as opposed to those who are going to be stable with or without treatment. So next slide, it should be slide 16. Uh, so disease progression in interstitial lung diseases uh, disease can be detected in different ways. Many, um, many times um, it's by increased symptoms, um, and so that's, that's worsening cough or worsening shortness of breath um, or fatigue or worsening um, or, or, or weight loss, but it can also be detected by worsening disease on a CT scan, and so that's why we often do uh, periodically do CT scans to see if the disease has progressed. Um, and then it can also be detected um, by decreased lung function. So that's what, um, when we do those pulmonary function tests, that's what we are measuring. We are measuring lung function to try to quantify, or to try to determine how much of the lung has been uh, uh, affected. And so the first two points, the symptoms and the CAT scan, are, are pretty self-explanatory, but I do want to take a minute to talk about uh, pulmonary function tests and to what that um, what we are measuring and how that tells us about disease progression. Next slide, slide 17. So measures of lung function are a useful indicator of the severity and progression of interstitial lung disease. Um, and they're helpful because they do, um, even though they're, they're, they can be challenging for patients to do, they can be hard and patients sometimes feel like they're doing a bad job. But not, there's no such thing, but they are helpful to us because uh, they, wh there's no radiation risk. It's a very low risk test and it tells us a lot of information about how the lung is working. And when we do pulmonary function tests uh, in patients with interstitial lung disease, um, the two things that we really care about um, are on that report on the right um, are, is the top uh, row under spirometry, which is forced vital capacity or FBC, and then the top row under diffusion, which is the DLCO. So FBC refers to measures how much air the lung can hold when a patient uh, takes a really, really deep, uh, their deepest possible breath. And it's measured in liters. And so we can, um, and then we have reference values. We have predicted values for what is expected or average um, for um, based on a patient's height and age. So lung function is, um, lung volume is um, largely dependent on height. And so short, longer, uh, taller people have larger lung volumes and shorter people have um, smaller lung volumes. And so that FBC, that reference value, is a predicted or average number for some, uh, based on somebody's age and height. And then we measure, so we have those references, we have the predicted, and then we have what um, the patient's actual lung volume is. And so in this report, this is just um, a random report, that for this patient, their predicted or their average 
um, that what, what's expected for their lung volume is 3.45 liters. That means that they, uh, on average, somebody with their age and their height should be able to hold 3.45 liters of air in their lungs. But this particular patient could only hold 1.6 liters of air in their lungs. And so that's 48% of what's predicted. So that tells us that about half of that patient's lung, or about 50%, has been affected in some ways by their lung disease. Um, and then the diffusion capacity, the DLCO, that measures how easy it is for that oxygen to get into the body. So back to that early slide when I talked about what the alveoli does, this measures that process in the alveoli, how easy it is for oxygen to diffuse through whether it's healthy lung tissue or scarred lung tissue or, or anything in between, um, it measures how easy it is for oxygen to get into the bloodstream. And so um, for this particular person, um, their predicted diffusing capacity should be 26.6. This is um, just a random unit. Um, but this person's um, diffusing capacity was 5.9. So that's 22% of what's expected. And so this is a very sensitive measure of any even subtle early abnormalities in the lungs. And it really tells us about um, the, the extent of the damage that's been happening in the alveoli. And so those are the numbers that are very useful. And in particular, the um, forced vital capacity or FVC, the top number under spirometry, has been used in clinical trials and in research studies to as a marker of disease severity and as a marker of disease progression because we know that that number uh, correlates pretty well with how the disease is progressing. And again, it's a non-invasive measure, so it's easy to measure every four weeks or every three months or every six months as opposed to doing CAT scans, which have radiation and increased risk with them. So that number correlates and tells us and predicts pretty well how that patient um, ha outcomes for that patient, so that the lower the number, the more advanced the stage of the disease, um, and um, the higher the um, the higher the mortality rate. Um, and so, when um, when we do clinical trials of research studies of new medications for interstitial lung disease, um, we often look at that number, the FVC, and. In recent years, um, in 2014, there were two medications that became approved for IPF. These were two antifibrotic medications, and um, those medications can both slow disease progression in patients with IPF. And so on this graph, this graph is now similar to the prior graph, but it's a little bit more granular. So on the bottom, you can see time, but this is now on a much, much shorter timeline. This is time in six months and 12 months. And on the left side, you can see that this is this measuring lung function, which is forced vital capacity or that FCC in liters. And so in a healthy aging lung, this is the top lack line, um, FCC can drop a little bit over the course of the year. It, it, dro it declines, so, um, it drops about 2%. Um, so it might go from four liters to 3.9 liters. But in a patient uh, with IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the FCC might drop a lot more over the course of 12 months. So that bottom line, the purple line, is um, what, ha what might happen in a patient with IPF who does not take any medication for the IPF. Um, so here um, you can see that this is a patient with a pretty rapid progression. So this patient has lost about 10% of their lung volume over 12 months. So their FVC dropped from four liters to 3.6 liters. Um, so that's without any medication. But now you can see that on, uh, with medications, on average, those medications will slow the progression of that disease by about 50%. So what that means is that with one of these medications, uh, some patients, many patients, will have a benefit in that their lung function, their FVC, only drops by 5%, whereas without medications, it would have dropped by 10%. And the two antifibrotic medications that we talk about and that were originally approved for the treatment of IPF are nintedinib, which is OFEV, 
um, and profenadone, uh, which is S3. And they have different mechanisms of action, but their benefit in terms of slowing this uh, drop in lung function, the progression of the disease, is very similar. So they roughly about, uh, decrease the progression by about 50% over the course of the year. And more recently, we found out that med the same medications that are used to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can also slow disease progression in other types of interstitial lung diseases that are not IPF, but have this fibrotic uh, disease behavior and the progression of the fibrosis. So the first one on the left side is nintedinib or OFEV. This was a large study that was published in 2019, and shortly after that, this medication became approved for the treatment of patients who have progressive fibrosis and interstitial lung diseases that are not IPF, in addition to already being approved for the treatment of IPF. And so this medication, you can see on the bottom, that graph is very similar to the graph I just showed you for IPF. So on average, this was a large study. This was more than 600 patients. It was, it was a phase three study, so a very good study done in all over the world. Um, so in these patients, these were all patients with all kinds of interstitial lung disease that had fibrosis that was progressive, that had progressed over the past two years. Um, and uh, they were, half of them were given the OFA or nintedinib, and half of them were given placebo. And so the bottom line, the light blue line is, um, plus the, what happened to patients over the course of one year who took the placebo and their um, lung function dropped by about 150 milliliters. They lost about 150 milliliters of their um, FBC versus patients who took nintedinib, um, it dropped by half of that. So their, at the end of the year, their lung function only dropped by about 75 milliliters. And so there was uh, obviously th these are averages and um, there's a lot of variability for individual patients, but this was still a very good study that showed us that this medication may be effective in slowing disease, uh, slowing progression of fibrosis in patients who have all kinds of different interstitial lung diseases. Um, there's a lot, there's less data available for profenadone. So there has not been a large phase three study like this one for profenadone, but there's been a number of smaller studies, uh, phase two studies, so those are earlier phases and usually a lot smaller, that have suggested that profenadone has a similar benefit, but we just haven't definitively proven it, and so profenadone doesn't have that same indication as an head in it, but it's probably helpful for some patients. And so this is just one study that I wanted to point out. This just came out last week. This was a study of profenadone for patients with uh, interstitial lung disease that was associated, that was caused by rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so you can see that the graph for, uh, for this study is similar um, in that patients who took placebo in red, um, their FBC again dropped uh, by about 150 milliliters over the course of a year on average. Uh, versus patients who took profenadone, um, where their FCC dropped by half of that, or went, ended up at, um, dropped by 75 milliliters of the course of the year. But this was a study of only 120 patients, compared to more than 600 for the other study. And so there's just, um, it's been a little bit more challenging to, um, to do studies with profenadone, especially because with the pandemic, it's been hard to do clinical trials um, over the last couple of years. So let's just pause this and summarize all um, what we already know, what I just explained. So interstitial lung diseases involve scarring and inflammation of the tissue surrounding the air sacs of the lung. There are many different causes of interstitial lung diseases uh, and different types of interstitial lung diseases. Some types of interstitial lung disease result in progressive replacement of healthy lung tissue by scar tissue, and that's what we call pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, is one type of interstitial lung disease that is characterized by progressive scarring of the lungs without a known cause. IPF is treated with antifibrotic medications, which can slow disease progression. And some patients with other types of interstitial lung disease also develop progressive scarring in the lungs that behaves similarly to IPF. But that's not uniform for all interstitial lung diseases. And so, in those patients that develop uh, progressive scarring in the lungs, antifibrotic medications can be effective in slowing disease progression as well. So with that in mind, 
very recently, um, the, a, a bunch of experts um, treating patients, taking care of patients and doing research about interstitial lung disease got together and came up with this updated clinical practice guideline um, for that updated some recommendations for the treatment of ICF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and also for the first time defined this term called PPF or progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and so, next slide, slide 22. Um, so, in these guidelines, progressive pulmonary fibrosis has been defined as um, having at least two of the following over the past year, and that's worsening respiratory symptoms, physiologic progression, so that's uh, progression based on the pulmonary function test. And it could be defined as one of one, one of these, either an absolute decline or an absolute drop in forced vital capacity or FCC of 5% or more over the course of a year, or an absolute drop in the diffusing capacity, the DLCO of 10% or more, um, and or an increased extent of fibrotic features on CT scan. And that's in a patient with interstitial lung disease and lung scarring or pulmonary fibrosis um, other than IPF with no alternative explanation. So as you can imagine, some of these things could be caused by other things. There could be an associated condition like pulmonary hypertension that develops that could be causing the patient symptoms. So before we can diagnose pulmonary, progressive pulmonary fibrosis, we have to make sure that it's not something else that's ca causing this, these, um, the, 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 um, these criteria, these, uh, the symptoms or the worsening on the CT scan. Uh, and so, again, these were not um, these were not made up. These were based on what we have already observed. What happens in patients with IPF and with all kinds of other interstitial lung diseases? So, next slide. We should be on slide 23. Um, so, first of all, why why do we even do this? Why why define a new term? Um, well, it tells us about a subgroup of patients that have similarities in disease behavior. And that can be very helpful um, because it can those that subgroup of patients may respond to some particular treatments um, in a similar way, um, and uh, it can help us predict prognosis um, a little bit better in those patients. Um, and then it also allows us to do research to conduct clinical trials of new therapies, new treatments. For, um, for this large group of patients that have um, a disease that behaves in a similar way. So next slide, uh, slide 24. And then the other question that comes up a lot from doctors and from patients is why, come up, what, why these particular criteria? And the reason those criteria were chosen is because they have been shown in many research studies to be associated with poor outcomes. So patients who meet those criteria for progressive pulmonary fibrosis tend to, um, tend to do worse, tend to have more symptoms over time and um, worse quality of life and tend to um, have a, a worse prognosis. Um, those criteria very broadly are already used in clinical care. So those are things that we are already doing in clinical care. We are often periodically um, getting CAT scans. We are often asking about symptoms all, all the time, and we are frequently doing pulmonary function tests and breathing tests. And so it's already what, it's not, this is not a new entity and not something new that we have to do. It's nothing extra that we have to do. It's already um, something that we were doing. Um, those particular um, criteria um, were felt to be less variable than other measures. So there were other things that were considered um, in the criteria for, prog for, for progressive pulmonary fibrosis, things like acute exacerbations um, and six-minute walk distance and supplemental oxygen use. But it was felt that those other things um, tended to be more variable and less consistent over time in predicting the, the, the prognosis for patients. So that um, they, they might fluctuate. Somebody might um, be on and off oxygen. The exacerbations people can recover. So it's not, a, uh, it's not as re reliable of a measure of disease progression. Um, that's a little bit controversial. And then um, very broadly, those general categories of the criteria have been used in research studies, um, including that uh, trial, the inbuilt trial, 
although the specific numbers that were used for the cutoff and um, in this definition um, are a little bit different than what's been used in the other uh, in, in prior studies. Um, but um, they were extrapolated from prior studies of IPF, where we saw that those specific numbers um, are associated with uh, with disease progression and worse outcomes in patients. Uh, and so what does this mean for patients and for their diagnosis? Well, the short answer is that it doesn't mean all that much. It doesn't change the underlying diagnosis and it doesn't change how we approach patients. This was meant to provide some guidelines, some more concrete guidelines for, um, for all doctors taking care of patients with interstitial lung disease um, to cue them in to a specific subgroup of patients that is at the highest risk of disease progression. And so it doesn't change the underlying diagnosis. The way we approach diagnosis of pulmonary, um, progressive pulmonary fibrosis is the same way we always did. We evaluate at length and diagnose the specific type of interstitial lung disease. We try to figure out what the cause is, whether it's an autoimmune disease, whether it's an exposure like um, causing hypersensitivity pneumonitis or rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma causing interstitial lung disease. And then we first treat that underlying interstitial lung disease. So if it's an autoimmune disease, we would treat that autoimmune disease. If it's an exposure, we would remove the exposure. And then we monitor over time for disease progression. Um, and we do that the same way we've been doing it all along, but right? with uh, a clinical evaluation, seeing the patient, asking about their symptoms, um, and doing pulmonary function testing, and, um, and, and seeing if the disease is getting worse, or it's, it's stable, or perhaps it has improved. Um, and so if there's disease progression, the first thing we do is evaluate the reasons for progression. And so it might be that it's progression of the underlying fibrosis or the scarring in the lungs, but it could also be because there's some, something new that has developed. There is um, pulmonary hypertension, for example. And if we find that we've ruled out those other causes of progression and there's actually progression of fibrosis, then we consider antifibrotic medication. Trace, uh, patients with progressive pulmonary fibrosis can be treated in many different ways. Medications are one of them. But using supplemental oxygen is also really important and can um, increase exercise ability, increase um, uh, help patients feel better. Um, often referral to palliative care to help patients manage their symptoms is, is, can be really helpful and is important um, to manage um, all of the associated symptoms associated with interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary rehabilitation is an important aspect of um, taking care of patients with interstitial lung disease. It can actually be really helpful in improving patients feel better. Um, for select patients, a lung transplant evaluation may be appropriate, and then offering um, access to clinical trials to try to um, improve, to, to try to develop new medications. So again, medications are just one small aspect of the care of patients, um, but the medications we use. So um, nintedinib is the first one, um, and it is, it's the number one antifibrotic that we use. It's the one that's approved for this condition, and it's been the best studies. Um, some doctors might consider perfenidone as, as, a, as an alternative, but this is not recommended in the guidelines. The guidelines say that there has not been enough research done um, on perfenidone um, to recommend it as a treatment. So um, we just need bigger and better studies before we can say definitively that this is, um, this is a good treatment for it. Um, then we also continue treatment of the underlying interstitial lung disease. So for some patients, we would still continue treatment of their rheumatoid arthritis or their scleroderma or whatever might, else might be um, driving the interstitial lung disease. And then we treat any associated, we evaluate and we treat for associated conditions like pulmonary hypertension. Um, next slide, slide 27. Um, and then monitoring is the same as I already mentioned. So number one is evaluate, being seen in clinic and asking patients about their symptoms. And I do that, many of us do that uh, roughly every three to four months, um, sometimes more often if a patient's not doing well, sometimes less often if a patient has been very stable for, for a long time. And during that visit, um, roughly every three to four months, we will also do pulmonary function testing or a bleeding test to, ev to evaluate um, for progression. We may also do a six-minute walk test um, once or twice a year, sometimes more often if there's a change in clinical status. Um, and that, that is to tell, tell us both about the um, functional capacity of a patient, but also to see if they 
now need to start using supplemental oxygen. We might do a CAT scan. We can't do CAT scans all the time because it's a lot of, it can be um, over time, a lot of radiation. But um, if there's a change in one of the others in symptoms or in breathing tests, um, or potentially once or uh, every one to two years, we might do a CAT scan to reassess how the disease is doing. And then we also need to think about if there are any associated conditions um, and uh, think about looking for pulmonary hypertension specifically by doing an echocardiogram. Um, but so, so this is um, what the guidelines, the guidelines have provided us a framework for this new entity for progressive pulmonary fibrosis. But the care of each patient needs to be individualized. Just because a patient doesn't meet those specific criteria that were outlined in the, in the, um, in the guidelines doesn't mean that they don't need to be monitored or um, that they, may, they don't have progressive disease. Their disease may be just more slowly progressive, but they may still be appropriate for antifibrotic medication. So those, gui those guidelines are just guidelines. They're just suggestions. Ultimately, a doctor and a patient need to decide together what is best for that patient. And then um, this is slide 28, one of my last slides. Um, so I mentioned that having the, that new definition can be helpful in um, facilitating research for, for a lot of different patients with interstitial lung diseases. And so one of the clinical trials that is um, forthcoming for patients with pulmon progressive pulmonary fibrosis is going to be a large phase three study of a new medication. Um, right now it's called BI-101-5550 um, for treatment of pro um, progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and so this was a recent phase two study for patients with ICF that showed that the, the, this medication, this, this new um, potential treatment was effective in slowing disease progression over a short time period, over 12 weeks. And this was a study done in about 150 patients. And so now um, we are in the planning phases um, for the larger trial, which plans to en enroll about 1,000 people with ITF all over the world, and another 1,000 people with progressive um, uh, fibrosing interstitial lung diseases, so other interstitial lung diseases that also have fibrosis and disease progression, to study this medication over the course of a year, so a much longer and a larger study. So we'll see, but this is you know, potentially very exciting. So to summarize, what is progressive pulmonary fibrosis? This is a new term that refers to progressive scarring of the lungs observed in some patients with interstitial lung diseases. Um, there are specific criteria based on change in symptoms, CAT scan and or lung function over time, and treatment with antifibrotic medications may be appropriate for some patients along with other treatment of the specific type of interstitial lung disease um, and enrollment in clinical trials. Uh, and with that, I will end, and I'll take any questions, um, and I will also say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really wonderful, and I have to say it's so timely, um, just reflecting uh, some of this new information, um, new guidelines, and uh, new research that will be going on that will, you know, has the a, a potential to really impact our community. So thank you very much. Um, we do have time for some questions um, and I will I will toss them to you and we can talk about them and we'll get to as many as we can. I know we have a lot of engagement today, so we'll see how it goes. Um, the first one I have is um, when your doctor in the office says, you, you know, you've been in a few times now, your doctor says, well, you are stable. What do you mean when you say that to a patient? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say if a doctor says that and a patient doesn't know what it means exactly, I would encourage, first of all, the patient to, to really like ask the doctor specifically what it means. Because stability can mean a, a lot of different things. Um, when we talk about those criteria and, and the different ways that patients can progress, um, you know, this, it, it, the flip side is also true. So it could be stability in symptoms, it could be stability in lung function tests, it could be stability on a 
CAT scan, most often we are talking about stability by pulmonary function tests because those are the kind of objective measures that we're checking all the time um, in, in addition to symptoms. But symptoms can be so variable and some patients have a lot of symptoms. Some patients have a lot of disease and don't have a lot of symptoms. So that's why the lung function tests are so helpful in telling us about the how advanced the disease is. And so usually we're talking about that, but I would just encourage every single patient to, to really go back to the doctor and say, like, what do you mean by that exactly? That's great advice. I think if there's something that happens there that we don't understand, I think that is a really good opportunity to ask questions, um, make notes, and even follow up if it doesn't occur to you at that time. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, logistically, and I want to get these out of the way just to give people a chance to get to what they need. Um, somebody did ask if the um, if the slides were available, if you will go to your control panel to the right of your screen and uh, look all the way down almost to the bottom where it says handouts. There's a little um, triangle there. If you'll click that triangle, you should be able to um, download our uh, slides in PDF. Day. So go ahead and take that opportunity if you're looking for them. We are recording this and it will be posted at a later date. Um, so that will be available as well. And you'll get some communication about that um, uh, when it posts. Um, next question, uh, Dr. Podolantic, is uh, is a kind of link to that. But when we're talking about um, uh, progression and stability, what should we be looking for at home in between visits? Um, and, and watching for and making note of? Sure. Um, so uh, one is just symptoms, not just symptoms, but probably the most important is, is how a patient feels, how, how you feel in between your visit and what is the quality of life, how short of breath you are. Um, are you able to, I always ask patients if they're able to do things around the house or, or just in general that they want to do. Um, the other thing that I encourage patients to do, most of my patients, is to obtain a pulse oximeter, um, which is that little probe that you can put on your finger to monitor your oxygen levels. And that's a very helpful uh, device that can tell us um, what the ox how, how, how the oxygen um, is getting into the body, how the gas exchange is happening, and can tell us about the overall um, con condition in the lung. And so I encourage patients to get to know what their normal pulse, um, uh, pulse oximeter values are, what their normal oxygen saturations are with or without oxygen, um, and to get to know their own bodies. Because if one of the signs of a flare could be new symptoms, but could also be a drop in oxygen levels. And so often when patients call me and say, I'm more short of breath, if they know what their normal oxygen levels are at, at baseline, whether that's both at rest and with exertion after they've been walking around. Um, and I, if, if I know that there's a, a sudden change, that that's much more concerning to me and it might be a reason for them to come into the office or even come into the emergency room. So that, that's something else to watch. Um, there's also, I will just mention that home spirometry is, is being evaluated as a potential um, additional device, an additional thing that patients can sometimes um, monitor. It's not really widely used yet for our patients with, um, with interstitial lung disease kind of generally, but it is something that maybe in the future some people might find useful. But primarily it's symptoms and oxygen levels. Great. Thank you. The next question I have um, is an interesting one. Um, are there any blood tests that will indicate that an interstitial lung disease is progressive or progressing? Yeah, that is an amazing question. And that's actually something I'm very interested in and I do research in. Um, so the bottom line is there's nothing yet that is um, very useful that, that we um, routinely use in clinical practice. Um, there's there's, so these are, these are things that are, we call biomarkers. There's been a lot of different biomarkers in the blood that have been studied, and there are some potentially in development clinically, but there isn't one test right now that I can measure that's going to help me predict how a patient's going to do, how extensive their disease is. Um, one of the things that's starting to become a little more used because it's so available is, is a, um, a measure on, um, on a blood test called a monocyte count, and that's actually starting to look like it may be useful that a very high monocyte count may be associated with um, 
kind of more rapid disease progression and worse outcomes, but it's not, it has not been validated yet for, for full clinical use. So more of that on the horizon, I think it would be really great to have a, a blood test that could help us um, develop a better prognosis for a patient, but, but not, nothing quite yet. That's a great answer. And this is such an interesting area. I think as we're, um, you know, as, as more and better therapeutics get um, developed, and you mentioned early detection being important because, you know, intervening early might be a, to benefit of people. But in, in the case of progressive colony fibrosis, you have to wait for the progression to occur uh, before you can detect that it's there because so many people won't have progression. And so being able to detect that that or predict that that will happen with um, reliability, I think it really help um, help people and help us treat them better. Um, I think we may sure. have one more question. What time for one more question before the hour is up? We did have a lot of questions about um, you spoke a bit about um, antifibrotic treatments, nintedinib and perfenidone, but we did have some questions about anti-inflammatory or immune modulatory therapies to include things like mycophenolate, which is also called Celsept, um, or uh, prednisone, things like that. Um, and maybe you could speak a little bit about when those might be deployed um, in the setting of an interstitial lung disease um, versus, or maybe, and then with the addition of an antifibrosis medicine? Absolutely. That's a great question. So, so that's when I spent um, quite a bit of time trying to emphasize how important it is to try to make that specific diagnosis of the interstitial lung disease. Because mycophenolate is often um, the first-line treatment for some types of interstitial lung disease where there's a lot of inflammation in the body overall and specifically in the lungs. So we know that mycophenolate or cell sep can work well for um, interstitial lung diseases associated with scleroderma, for example, and it's the first line treatment and it's been shown to actually improve lung function in patients with scleroderma and interstitial lung disease. And so that's, so it can be the first line treatment. It is not a treatment for ITF and it should not be used as a treatment for ITF. It is an immune modulatory agent or an immunosuppressive medication. And we know that those medications don't work for IPF and can actually be harmful. But for other types of interstitial lung diseases where there's a lot of inflammation, mycophenolate can be very useful. And so that's why, again, we have to make that specific diagnosis and treat the underlying condition and then watch for progressive fibrosis. And only really in IPF where we know that it's um, ultimately um, a progressive disease is that we, we go to antifibrotics as, as first line. Um, or in certain conditions where they look like IPF on a CAT scan and there's just all fibrosis on the CAT scan and very little inflammation, but we start with antifibrotics. Um, but otherwise, we would consider an anti-inflammatory anti like mycophenolate. Great. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Panelanchik, I just want to thank you again for um, all the information that you presented uh, to us today. This is, like I said, so important and so timely. And I know everyone here appreciates it. It's going to be a great resource. Um, the recording will be up at some point um, for our community to refer back to. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you um, for having me. I really of, enjoyed this. Of course, friend. Um, I also want to thank all of you for listening today. This has been a wonderful session. I thank you all for your questions. Um, again, we will post this uh, recording later. If you will stay for a moment afterwards, you will get a, um, a survey asking you to just give some feedback about our session today and help inform us for future events. And uh, thank you again and uh, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>